Good afternoon. I'm Commander Anna Kahn, Associate Director for Communication with the Division of Environmental Health Science and Practice in the National Center for Environmental Health at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I'd like to welcome you to today's EH Nexus webinar on climate change and health, the risk to community health and healthcare utilization. For those of you that are new to EH Nexus webinars, I want to take a moment to provide some background information about EH Nexus. EH Nexus focuses on environmental public health topics. The purpose of EH Nexus is to build and foster environmental public health partnerships at the local, national, and global level. EH Nexus webinars provide participants with information about important public health topics such as climate change and their impact on public health. These webinars also include useful tools shared by subject matter experts and are often collaborations across the agency as well as with external public health partners. During today's EH Nexus webinar, there will be a presentation and a Q&A session with today's speakers. All participants joining us today are in listen-only mode. Closed captions are available for this webinar. Next slide, please. Today's EH Nexus webinar will be available to view on demand in a few days after this webinar. You can find the video recording of today's webinar at CDC EH Nexus website. Next page, I mean, next slide, please. Thank you. You may submit questions at any time during today's presentation. To ask a question using Zoom, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, then type your question in the Q&A box. Next slide, please. Before we start the presentation and introduce our speakers, we're honored to have leadership provide opening remarks. It is my privilege to welcome to the webinar, Dr. Pat Brice, Director of CDC's National Center for Environmental Health and the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. Following Dr. Brice, Dr. Suma Nair, Director of the Office of Quality Improvement and the Health Resources and Services Administration's Bureau of Primary Health Care will deliver opening remarks. It is my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Brice. Thank you, Anne. I'm very happy to be here today. Hello to everybody across the country. And I'd be remiss if I didn't wish everybody a happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, so happy St. Patrick's Day to you. Uh, I wanna personally thank each of every one of you for coming to today's presentation. This collaboration between our two agencies. It's important that we recognize that climate change impacts all of us. And as such, it's great to be able to bring our subject matter experts today to talk about this. As CDC's climate health program grows, and as our knowledge about the different ways that climate can affect human health grows, it's become increasingly apparent that the healthcare providers play a key and important role in protecting human health and the health of communities while the nation adapts to health impacts of climate change that are, as we all know, are already happening today. For example, doctors and nurses and other healthcare providers may need to treat increasing numbers of people affected by heat related illness. We need to have a healthcare system that can handle exposures to wildfire smokes. Uh, from smoke from wildfires affecting communities, for example. We know that the data from healthcare facilities can be used to identify populations at risk and target interventions and drive nationwide decision-making. It's also important that we remember and recognize that in many cases, the impacts of climate change are disproportionately affected certain communities compared to other communities. So we also need to rely on the healthcare system to help us address some of those inequalities, see where those health inequalities exist, and make sure we target those communities to address those inequalities. So there's an environmental justice component that we also have to be cognizant of. We also have to adapt to changing weather conditions that could bring severe storms and flooding and mass evacuations and what that might mean in terms of caring for people going forward. Today's weather will provide crucial information, I'm sorry, today's webinar will provide crucial information for healthcare facility personnel to properly prepare for the effects of climate change We'll also provide information and resources that can be shared with patients and colleagues and help everyone to stay prepared. So once again, thank you very much for being here. I think this is a crucially important topic. I'm excited about the opportunity to discuss this with you today. And I'd like to now ask Dr. Nair to introduce her comments as well. 
Dr. Gare. Thank you very much, Dr. Bricey. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, uh, wherever you may be joining us from. Thank you for joining today's presentation and discussion. My name is Sue Manair, and I'm the Director of the Office of Quality Improvement in the Bureau of Primary Health Care at HRSA. In my capacity, my team and I focus on the Health Center Program's mission of increasing access to and quality of primary care services to underserved communities and vulnerable populations nationwide. Unfortunately, we know all too well that the change in climate and related environmental impacts and natural disasters pose critical threats both to healthcare access and good health for us all, but especially for certain groups that are disproportionately impacted by climate change, including many of the communities and populations health centers care for. That's why HRSA is so pleased to join our colleagues from CDC and Denver Health today for this important discussion. Over the last few years, we've addressed the issues of climate and environment and health, mostly from an emergency response or preparedness perspective. Today's presentation will help us shift and begin to expand that perspective by raising the awareness of climate and health-related issues and how to prepare to provide equitable care to those most at-risk communities that we serve. Individuals already living with chronic diseases such as hypertension, type 2 diabetes, cholesterol, overweight and obesity. With the global changes in climate that we're, witne we're witnessing geological shifts, extreme weather events, and the beginning of events that have such a significant health impact we've never seen before, such as unseasonable weather, heavy rainfall, flooding, droughts, tornadoes, hurricanes, wildfires, and more. Unfortunately, many health centers know firsthand the impact of destruction and loss of physical structures, loss of power and internet connectivity, the inability to communicate and deliver care, and then the aftermath of health complications associated with flooding, standing water, cholera, mold, increased cases of asthma, skin infections, diseases, not to mention the mental health challenges that are related to displacement and loss of life. Um, a recent infographic I saw cited that 67% of Americans agree that climate is affecting population health, and 55% of Americans are anxious about climate change's impacts. The destructive effects of climate change and resulting poor mental health well, um, and well-being are also likely to fail dis fall disproportionately on communities that are already disadvantaged by historic and current social and economic systems. For decades, our environmental protection campaigns have led us to raise our awareness motivated us to care and take some small steps to reduce our environmental impact through recycling, carpooling, planting trees, making dietary changes. And while all of that is absolutely necessary and useful, attempts in this scale have not been sufficient to avoid what the United Nations is now calling a threat to human well-being. So today, we want to take an important step to better position all of ourselves to address this threat to well-being. We're going to learn about the potential for health impacts across the country and uh, specific to certain regions. And with this knowledge, we hope that we can prepare to meet the future, whether it's in the area of workforce development, infrastructure redesign or fortification, um, patient and community education, and of course, healthcare delivery. So without further delay, I would love to turn this presentation back over to Commander Anna Khan. Anna? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nair, and thank you, Dr. Bricey, for opening remarks. Before I introduce the speakers, uh, let's get the audience's thoughts on climate and health with a poll. What topic are you most interested in related to climate and health? Disaster preparedness, disease carried by vectors, foodborne and waterborne disease, air quality, heat-related illness, mental health. Okay, it looks like it looks like most of you are interested in disease preparedness, followed closely by mental health and disease carried by vectors. Thank you. 
Okay. Now, next slide, please. Now I'd like to welcome our speakers for today's EH Nexus webinar. We're pleased to have with us Dr. Ari Manangan. Mr. Manangan, I'm sorry I called you doctor. Mr. Manangan, thank you for joining us today. Mr. Manangan is a health scientist with the Climate and Health Program in the, in the Division of Environmental Health Science and Practice at CDC. Our second presenter is Dr. Beth Gillespie. Dr. Gillespie is a guest researcher in the Climate and Health Program in the Division of Environmental Health Science and Practice at CDC. I'll now turn it over to Mr. Manangan. Mr. Manangan, please proceed. All right, thank you, Anna. And I don't mind being called doctor, although I don't have the <laughs> credentials. Thank you. All right. Thank uh, you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bryce and, and Dr. Nair, and thank you for this opportunity for collaboration between our agencies and allowing me to speak on the health effects of climate change. Next slide, please. So here are our learning objectives for the webinar. I will be talking about the CDC's Climate and Health Program first and discuss a few climate-related hazards and the potential health effects. I will also be touching on those populations and communities most at risk to climate-related health effects. And finally, my colleague Beth will be discussing an analysis on the use of electronic health records to help characterize those most at risk. Next slide, please. The CDC is focused on climate change because the impacts to human health are very broad, from increasing the risk of vector-borne diseases such as West Nile virus and Lyme disease, to bringing more intense heat waves and a greater frequency of severe weather events that can cause flooding. These changes in climate-related exposures translate into increasing health risk, as seen in the outer circle of this diagram. Next slide, please. So again, I'm a health scientist in the CDC's Climate Health Program, which has been funded by Congress since 2009. The program serves as a resource for federal, state, local, territorial, territorial and tribal health agencies to build resilience to the health effects of climate change. So one of our main goals is to prepare public health practitioners to address the health effects of climate change. So we provide the tools, guides, and processes to help assess vulnerability to possible health effects. And we also serve as a leader in planning for public health effects of climate change. Next slide, please. The CDC Climate Health Program through the Climate Ready States and Cities Initiative currently funds nine states and two cities to build resilience against these health effects. The grantees utilize the BRACE framework, which was developed by the Climate Health Program, and the most recent grantees were awarded in September of 2021, where they will build on previous work with an emphasis on adaptations, evaluations, and also focus on health equity. Next slide, please. And here's a map of our current climate and health grantees, which now includes two cities, San Francisco and Santa Clara. Next slide. And here's a map of previous grantees of the Climate Ready States and Cities Initiative. As you can see, we have supported a number of states, cities, tribes, and US territories to help build resilience to the health effects of climate change. Next slide. So we, here we have a more detailed look at the BRACE framework, which is uh, utilized by our grantees. Step one is anticipating climate impacts and assessing health vulnerabilities. Step two is projecting the disease burden using either climate models and population models. Step three is assessing effectiveness of public health interventions, for example, such as establishing a cooling shelter during an extreme heat wave. Step four is develop and implement a climate and health adaptation plan to help build this community resilience. And step five is evaluating these impacts and health interventions to improve health. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to more specifically uh, talk about how climate can affect health. So one of the effects of climate change that may not seem so obvious is how climate will directly affect air pollution. Climate change will increase the risk of wildfires by producing warmer and drier conditions. There will also be an increase in smog, pollen, and mold, which can lead to asthma and allergy attacks. Climate change is projected to harm health by increasing ground level ozone and particulate matter uh, pollution. Ground level ozone is a key component of smog and is associated with many health problems, diminished, such as diminished lung function, uh, increased emergency room visits, and increases in premature deaths. So individuals that are most at risk to air pollution include those with heart disease, heart and respiratory condition, conditions such as heart disease, asthma, and chronic lung disease. Next slide, please. 
So in the Climate and Health Program, we are focused on assessing the health effects, the health risk of climate related exposures, uh, such as wildfires and the resulting air pollution. An example uh, of such an assessment is research on the mortality of burden associated with wildfire smoke, as led by my colleague, Rishvani Athan. Next slide, please. Previous studies have shown that wildfires are increasing and the associated air quality has been worsening, as reflected in this map of data published in 2018 showing PM2.5 levels. PM2.5 concentrations have increased over this 28 year period and particularly in the Northwestern United States. Next slide, please. So our program is quantitatively assessing how changes in wildfires and smoke exposure are affecting health. The effects from wildfire smoke are far reaching, but the brunt of the health impacts due to high levels of smoke are observed in the Western United States. So in this slide, we describe the exposure risk in terms of both the number of smoke days and the number of person days of exposure. So for instance, all Western states in the last 10 years have experienced significant smoke exposure during the wildfire season between May and November. And certain states have had close to 25% of all days between May and November with some levels of smoke. Next slide, please. Climate change also places a burden on mental health. Increased frequency and severity of extreme weather events can lead to stress, depression, anxiety, PTSD, and suicidal thoughts. So individuals that are most at risk include children, older adults, pregnant and postpartum women, people with mental illness, people of lower incomes, homeless people, first responders, and people who rely on the environment for their livelihood, such as farmers. Next slide, please. So higher temperatures, changes in rain patterns, and disrupted ecosystems help spread diseases carried by insects, ticks and rodents. Individuals that are most at risk include those that spend more time outdoors. Next slide, please. Climate change is also affecting extreme weather. Increased frequency and severity of heavy downpours, floods, droughts, and major storms can lead to injury, illness, displacement, and death. Individuals that are most at risk to extreme weather include people who lack access to evacuation routes, people with disabilities, those in wheelchairs who, and who can't use stairs, older adults, and people with lower income. Next slide, please. Higher water temperatures, Heavier downpours, rising sea levels, and more flooding help spread gastrointestinal illness and diseases from toxins into swimming areas and drinking water. Individuals that are most at risk are children, the elderly, people with weakened immune systems, and people in communities that are dependent on fish and shellfish. Next slide, please. Climate change is expected to make hurricanes more powerful and more damaging. So here is an image of three hurricanes in the Atlantic Basin in September of 2017. These three hurricanes were Jose, Katia, and Irma. Hurricane Irma, which is this middle, middle hurricane, was an extremely powerful hurricane that caused an estimated $77 billion worth of damages and 134 fatalities. Next slide, please. The CDC's Climate and Health Program conducted a project to characterize flood risk to health infrastructure at the national level. Here we see a picture of a hospital in Bingham, Binghamton, New York during a flood event in 2006, and a picture of the Mercy Medical Center in Cedar Rapids, Iowa during a flood in 2008. Next slide, please. To characterize flood risk, we used data collected by FEMA uh, who delineates the 100-year and the 500-year floodplain. Could you advance the slide, please? When there was no data available from FEMA, uh, we used modeled floodplain data from EPA. And one more slide advancement. And the EPA data is shown here on this bottom map. And next slide. We assessed flood risk for hospitals, nursing homes, pharmacies, and dialysis clinics. We overlaid FEMA's, oh, next slide, please. We overlaid FEMA's floodplain data with facilities locations, as shown here in a map of medical facilities around the Savannah, Georgia area. In this map, those facilities within a flood hazard zone are colored in red. In the Savannah, Georgia area, at least six of these facilities lie with a 100-year flood risk zone or have a 1% chance of flooding in any given year. Next slide. 
And this is a national map of our results, uh, just looking at the American Hospital Association data. These are hospital facilities with the highest risk in red, those with moderate risk in orange, and those facilities not within a flood hazard area in gray. Additionally, we're, we perform this analysis for nursing homes, dialysis clinics, and pharmacies. Next slide. And here's a table of our results where we found that between 9% and 12% of all types of facilities analyzed lie within a flood hazard zone. With 9% of hospitals, 10% of nursing homes, 11% of all dialysis clinics, and 12% of all pharmacies. Although not shown in this table, we also estimate the number of beds within a flood hazard zone for hospitals and nursing homes. Next slide. So last year, we conducted this analysis for all HRSA facilities. Again, those areas in the highest risk are colored in red within the 100-year flood hazard zone. Orange facilities are within a 500-year flood hazard zone. Next slide. So here's a regional map of the HRSA facility analysis focused on the New York City area. And so in this regional map showing 751 HRSA facilities, approximately 7% 7, 7 or 50 out of 751 of these facilities are within a 100 year or a 500 year flood hazard zone. Next slide. So again, we conducted this analysis nationally, but the spatial resolution is very detailed. Here is a map of HRSA facilities in the Tampa, Florida area, where there is an even higher percentage of facilities within a flood hazard zone. Of the 75 HRSA facilities within this map, 19% of the facilities, or 14 out of 75, are within a flood hazard area. Again, facilities in red are located in the 100-year flood uh, zone, and those in orange are the, in the 500-year flood zone. So in this map, those areas in pink are the actual 100-year flood zones as delineated by FEMA. Next slide. And here is a table of our HRSA results on, at the national level. We see Her, HRSA facilities, 5% of HRSA facilities in the 100-year flood zone, and 500% within the 500-year flood hazard area. There are combined 1,387 HRSA facilities within either a 100-year or a 500-year flood hazard zone. Next slide, please. So the end goal of this analysis was intended to start the dialogue with healthcare stakeholders. For example, the operators of hospital systems and the nursing home care facilities. And we wanted to make sure that our healthcare infrastructure is resilient to the effects of climate change. So examples of adaptation strategies include relocation of mission critical essential services. These would include placing electrical generators in locations that cannot be easily flooded. This also includes evacuation planning and the training of medical staff in such flooding emergencies. Other adaptations include actual site modifications such as infilling land of flood risk zones and the building of levees or flood walls. Next slide, please. And now shifting away from flooding impacts, a direct health impact of climate change is extreme heat. Climate change is making heat waves worse. Higher heat, Increased humidity, longer and more frequent heat waves can lead to dehydration and stroke. Individuals that are most at risk to extreme heat include outdoor workers, student athletes, people in cities, people without air conditioning, people with chronic disease, pregnant women, older adults, and young children. Next slide, please. So extreme heat is a top priority in the climate and health program as heat kills more people in the US than all other natural disasters combined with an average of 702 deaths per year and over 67,000 emergency room visits, which is very likely an underestimate. And with climate change, we already are seeing more frequent and more intense extreme heat events, and this is expected to become worse. Next slide. And here's a map showing this increase in heat events throughout the continental United States. This map of the US of US counties represents the change in the number of heat wave days per year. Counties in dark red exhibited the greatest increase in the number of heat wave days as compared to counties in light red. Counties in gray did not exhibit a statistically significant change in the number of heat wave days. Next slide. 
So in June of 2021, uh, last year, all-time temperature records were broken in multiple cities in the US and Canada during a historic and dangerous heat wave. So there are real consequences of extreme heat. In a recent CDC report, my colleague in the Climate and Health Program using genomic surveillance data to track heat-related emergency room visits during the June heat wave in the Northwestern United States. The mean daily number of heat-related illness ED visits in HHA's Region 10, which is the Northwest United States, was more than seven times higher than in June 2019. And during a period from June 25th to June 30th in 2021, it was 69 times higher than during the same days in 2019. Next slide, please. And here we see the emergency department visit data for heat re related illness over that time, peaking around June 27th and June 28th. The dark Black line represents ED visits throughout 2021 occurring in the Pacific Northwest. So this line mirrors national summer peaks depicted in both of jagged dashed lines. It's a complete break from the flatter line of ED vis visits in Region 10 that occurred in the previous year in 2019. Next slide, please. So the Climate and Health Program also has a focus on health equity. A key component of the BRACE framework is to assess vulnerabilities. We do have guidance for health departments to build resilience to climate change. And this provides a framework on how health departments can use spatial data to create a map of communities that will be disproportionately affected by climate change. This climate and health vulnerability assessment allows localities to maximize resources by focusing on areas that will see the greatest impact. Next slide, please. So here we have an example of a climate and health vulnerability assessment, which utilizes not only data on the social determinants of health, but also measures of environmental determinants and measures of health response capacity. Next slide, please. And just recently in the fall of 2021, the program released the CDC Heat and Health Tracker, an interactive dashboard that helps communities prepare for and respond to extreme heat. So here's a screenshot of that CDC Heat and Health Tracker. So this is a free open source tool that provides real-time local level heat and health information to help communities better prepare for and respond to extreme heat events. Next slide. So these data dashboards prevent information in a simple and unique way that tells a story with a clear message. It was built for the user who wants more information than what is found in basic infographics, but does not necessarily have the time or expertise to query and interpret inf information from a database. So the goal of the dashboard is to be able to communicate in critical information through streamlined curated messaging to a broader audience. Next slide. So with such a wide range of health effects due to climate change, here is a range of things communities can do. So for extreme heat, communities can help develop a heat response plan by developing and expanding the extreme heat alert system. They can also ensure vulnerable populations can be reached and also plan cooling centers ahead of time. There are also ways to cool your community by increasing tree canopy, canopy to help keep buildings and surrounding areas cooler. We can use cool paving and reflective and porous material to help surrounding temperatures. For mental health problems, we can develop behavioral health plans for disasters. We can include clear messaging about access to mental health services and crisis counseling. For air pollution issues, communities can encourage active and mass transportation, such as walking, biking, and shared transportation that can lower traffic-related pollution. We can also reduce energy waste, energy by, um, by energy efficient buildings and vehicles can reduce air pollution. We can also weatherize homes, offices, schools, and other buildings. And we go, can also encourage the purchase of fuel efficient vehicles. For storms and floodings, communities can prepare infrastructure. We can identify buildings, roads, and other infrastructure that are most at risk to damage. And we can ensure existing and new infrastructure can withstand increasingly intense storms and flooding. We can also improve sanitation and water management. We can also protect drinking water sources and delivery systems, and we can prevent sanitary sewer overflows. And that was the end of my portion of the presentation, and I believe I will be giving this, um, handing this over to Anna. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Monongan. Um, now for our next speaker, Dr. Beth Gillespie. Thank you so much. Uh, she will now present. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, Ari. Ari. And now I'm going to talk about a project I've been working on to address heat-related health risk at the community level using the electronic medical record. And before I begin, I'd like to share some medical history. So I'm a guest researcher with the CDC's Climate and Health Program, as was mentioned in the introduction, but my full-time job is as a physician at Denver Health. Denver Health was founded in 1860 and became one of the nation's first HRSA centers in 1965 when it received funding from the Office of Economic Opportunity to expand its community health network. Denver Health is now a comprehensive integrated system which serves the broader Denver community through integrated FQHC family health centers, school-based clinics, EMS services, public health services, and more. And until the late 1990s, Denver Public Health was the city's primary public health department. This picture is from 1965 of two of the leaders of the effort that made Denver Health one of the nation's first federally funded community health center. So as next slide, please. As Ari mentioned, there are various ways of depicting heat exposure. We can talk about historic averages and future projections. The CDC's heat and health tracker here on the left shows that Denver County has, based on historic averages, between 10 and 22 days over 90. So we're breaking that average now since last year had approximately 45 days over 90, and the year before that in 2020 broke historic averages, um, hitting about 75 uh, days over 90. Um, on the right, uh, last slide, please. Thank you. On the right, um, this picture shows projections by Climate Central and based on 1997 to 2016 averages, there were no days above 100 degrees. And in Denver, we already broke 100 a handful of times last year. And the number of high temperature days are expected to increase to over 20 by the year 2050 and to over 35 by the year 2100 with even more occurring without emission cuts. So knowing what we know about how high, high temperatures affect health, um, these kinds of temperatures could lead to higher incidence of heart attacks, acute kidney disease, asthma exacerbations, and not to mention classic heat stroke and even death. So how do these health systems help patients build resilience to high temperatures? Next slide, please. The community in Denver has certainly focused, uh, voiced their concerns. So I mentioned that Denver Health includes Denver Public Health. Denver Public Health partnered with Denver Public Health and the Environment to conduct a community health assessment in the spring and summer of 2018. Climate change and heat arose as themes within the category of environmental quality, and some of the quotes are depicted here. According to the survey reported in 2020 by Yale on the right, 74% uh, of individuals in Denver County are concerned about climate change. Next slide, please. So with this in mind, and in and uh, the the um, the statistic that Ari showed of uh, the sixty seven thousand heat related illnesses really um, being an underestimate. Um, I'm looking into um, working with a team to look into these issues with the help of the electronic data record, which is something HRSA folks probably live and breathe every day. So my study is titled The Social Determinants of Health, High Temperatures, and Health Outcomes. And this is a retrospective cross-sectional cohort study looking at the population of Denver County that is served at Denver Health and aged four years and older. We were, the study spans five years and focuses on the high temperature periods between May and September um, from 2016 to 2020. My team, last slide please. My team is made up of um, uh, great um, researchers affiliated with the Denver Public Health and were funded by the Denver Office, um, Denver Health Office of Research pilot grant. Next slide, please. So this was actually the first aim of our study to calculate the relative heat vulnerability for Denver Health patients compared to remaining Denver residents. And we did this using data reported by Denver Department of Public Health and the Environment, which assigned a unique heat vulnerability score to each census tract. We overlaid these scores with geocoded patient records 
in order to assign a score to each Denver Health patient with an address. We then subtracted the number of Denver Health patients within each census tract from each tract's American Community Survey counts in order to assign scores to each remaining county resident. And this gave us this ratio of 1.4, saying the mean heat vulnerability score for Denver Health patients is 40% higher than that of remaining Denver residents. And just a few words on this, this map, um, which is a visual depiction of the um, heat vulnerability uh, scoring system. The um, areas in red signify the highest, the, the um, census tracts that are most vulnerable to um, heat and the light yellow, least vulnerable. And people um, that work at Denver Health are very familiar with the inverted L shape of this map. Um, these red uh, colored neighborhoods actually are where most Denver Health patients live. And so it wasn't a surprise that um, Denver Health patients have relatively higher heat vulnerability compared with the rest of the county. Next slide, please. So beyond this static score, the main aim of our study considers rates of utilization for each of 13 chronic disease groups. And this requires data on individual, on individual encounters linked with demographic and clinical identifiers. Encounter dates are also linked in order to determine whether the encounter falls on a day considered high heat, so over 90 degrees, versus non-high heat. And the final model represents an odds ratio of healthcare utilization on high heat days compared with healthcare, acute healthcare utilization on non-high heat days. Um, we'll adjust the model for these various factors, including residential heat vulnerability. And we have two hypotheses that we um, plan to test. The first um, includes the heat vulnerability scores and the second doesn't. So the first is that Denver Health patients living in higher heat vulnerability areas have increased heat exposed acute utilization. And the second is that patients with heat sensitive conditions have higher heat sensitive acute care utilization. Next slide, please. So a few um, words on data sources. Um, we have this unique um, data storing system in uh, Colorado, and this is called CORDS, which stands for the Colorado Health Observation Regional Data Service. It basically is a, um, a, a storage uh, site for where um, a network of healthcare, public health, and behavioral health partners can store their electronic um, health record data to support public health evaluation and monitoring efforts. And we basically uh, send all of our electronic health data um, categorized following a certain, um, uh, certain standards so that it, it is um, able to be analyzed, analyzed alongside other uh, centers. And so this, this information includes that we're looking at includes census location so that we can, um, we have each patient has a geocoded address. Each patient with an address has a geocoded address. Um, demographics, which includes basic descriptive data. Encounters, um, so we're looking at individual encounters between patients and medical personnel. And then diagnoses, uh, and the diagnoses come from the encounters and not from past medical problems or a chief complaint. We also have uh, environmental data, and that's um, how we determine which days are high heat or non-high heat, and these are from NOAA and EPA stations. And I already mentioned the heat vulnerability data. Um, and then we use the ACS data, um, and mainly we use that to help us calculate the relative um, heat vulnerability score. Next slide, please. So uh, Denver Health serves nearly a quarter million patients per year, and of these, Around 83,500 patients meet the criteria for our study aims, having sufficient number of encounters, being age four or older, and with clinical touch points spanning at least one year. Next slide. This graph represents the number of patients in each health category of interest, and all categories were chosen based on known risk factors for heat-related illness and based on previous scientific literature. 
the categories included um, are asthma, uh, looking at asthma in age four and older. And I should mention all other health conditions are looking at um, individuals or adults, so 19 and older. Uh, so other asthma, congestive heart failure, peripheral vascular disease, hypertension, chronic pulmonary disease, diabetes, both uncomplicated and complicated, renal disease, liver disease, depression, psychosis, alcohol use disorder, stimulant use disorder, and obesity. And looking at specific disease groups, we at Denver Health have relatively high percentages of people with hypertension, chronic lung disease, diabetes, depression, alcohol use disorder, and obesity. Next slide, please. So we, we still have a lot of work to do on this study. Um, I really wanted to demonstrate um, the use of the electronic medical record in the potential use of it for assessing community level heat uh, risk or at least association with utilization patterns. And so I um, wanted to mention both hypotheses and just emphasize um, if communities have not performed heat vulnerability assessment, um, the hypothesis two is still something um, that, that could be um, applicable to, to your setting. So in hypothesis two, we're looking at heat sensitive conditions that have higher heat sensitive um, utilization. After we've um, uh, performed our model and uh, looked at our sensitivity analyses, um, we hope to identify disease groups that are most associated with heat sensitive acute care utilization. And then as potential next steps, um, I'd like to evaluate utilization patterns of patients with specific ICD-10 codes, and then go out into the community and talk to representatives of higher risk disease groups to evaluate best practices for targeted education and targeted social services. So I hope that through this research using the EHR, which is a tool common to all HRSA facilities, I'm able to help our community receive more targeted heat prevention services. Next slide, please. So we've now reached the end of our presentation. Thank you so much for your time and attention. We spoke a lot about a lot today. Um, CDC tools for helping cities, states, territories, and tribes adapt to the environmental hazards associated with climate change. We discussed how specific populations and communities are more at risk than others to suffering health consequences of these hazards. And we've given an example of how the electronic health record can be used to assess individual and community level outcomes associated with factors in the environment. And um, speaking on behalf of myself and Ari, we're looking forward to future collaborations aimed at helping communities brace themselves against the biggest public health threat and opportunity of our time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gillespie and Dr. Oh, and Mr. Manangan uh, for providing this important information. Um, before we get uh, into our Q&A session, we have a final poll question for our audience. In the last five years, what climate emergencies have occurred in your region of the United States that affected people's health or access to health care? Hurricane, wildfire, flooding, tornado, earthquake. Okay, so hurricanes, wildfires and flooding all are very close here. Thank you, thank you for your uh, answers. Okay, now we'll go into our Q&A session. Next slide, please. To ask a question using Zoom, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, then type your question in the Q&A box. I think you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you, it's perfect. Okay, um, so, this first question is for you, Mr. Manangan. 
how can CDC help HRSA provide equitable health care to people who are geographically isolated or medically vulnerable? All right, great question. Uh, one way that the CDC can help HRSA is by providing this framework to help identify those communities that are most at risk um, to the health effects of climate change, where, which those, those communities are often found in areas with limited resources and social, socioeconomically disadvantaged. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Nair, the next question is for you. Has the Bureau of Primary Health Care started to consider how health centers will assess needs and report on health as it relates to climate and health? Yes, thank you for that question. So a couple of thoughts. Um, one, health centers are required to regularly conduct needs assessments to really inform and shape the programs and services that they deliver to their communities. And clearly information on climate related health impacts should be considered in those planning efforts, uh, not only for patient services, but also for health center operational and site planning. Um, second, in terms of reporting annually, health centers provide data and information on the kinds of services they provide to their communities and the health of the communities that they serve. So I could imagine as health centers get more engaged in this work, that they would definitely tell us about it in their reports and data and really share the impact on both health center services, um, patient outcomes, uh, you know, et cetera. So community partnerships, you know, staffing and the like. Uh, next, I would say, when we, have, uh, when we have had infrastructure funding to support development or enhancement of health center facilities, we have um, placed a, a premium on sustainable development, uh, you know, LEED certified, other kinds of building materials that are sustainable and um, eco-friendly. And I think uh, if any other future funding becomes possible, that obviously would be continue to be a key consideration, um, really minimizing the, the environmental footprint of the health center uh, facilities themselves. In addition uh, to funding, a key way we support health centers is through te uh, technical assistance. And today's session is an example of technical assistance where we bring together uh, years of scientific knowledge and historical knowledge around these topics to really help health centers make the local connections and have this data and information to support them. So in addition to these kind of federal partnerships and technical assistance, we will also be investing in our uh, technical assistance partners through funding at the national and state level to have them focus on this critical issue and support health centers in identifying and implementing strategies to reduce not only the health center's environmental impact, but most importantly, how best to care for patients and communities in response to climate-related health impacts, as well as how to prepare them, uh, the patients and communities, and the health center for future impacts. Um, so hopefully that helps. Thank you, Dr. Nair. The next question is for Dr. Gillespie. Are there particular environmental determinants HRSA could include in electronic data collection systems, which would help community health centers apply this framework and better identify populations most at risk? Yeah, um, I think that's that's a great question. Um, so I I think HRSA facilities are required to report on about twelve social determinants of health, um, and we heard during the presentation about how different environmental risk factors impact health. And I think that um, community health centers might be better prepared to start applying. Uh, the framework, um, step one, maybe in the BRACE framework, if um, they were to know more about um, the environmental uh, factors that are facing their um, particular patients beyond what we can look at in the current electronic health record. So some things that I think about that are useful in my clinical practice is knowing, um, you know, whether patients have access to uh, air conditioning or whether they feel um, whether they feel like they're at risk of losing um, their utilities and not not able to pay their utilities, um, because there are certain 
things that physicians can do, for example, like writing letters um, to try and get those restored. And then um, maybe whether um, patients know about and have access to high quality air filters, like in um, areas that have a lot of wildfire exposure. And then, um, and, and just, you know, what are, what is their occupation? Are they exposed to the, to high heat, to poor air quality um, in their occupation? And, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are other things that, um, that would be helpful in, in the environmental list of risk factors that, um, that I think could really frame a, a, a tailored approach to understanding vulnerability in the community. Um, I guess those are some of my initial thoughts. I hope that helps. Thank you. The next question is for Dr. Nair. How can health centers connect with state level efforts around resilience that we have learned about today? Great. Um, you know, I think the state level efforts that were discussed today are really from some of the great CDC investments in this arena. And so in a minute, I'll turn it over to Ari to provide a little insight there um, in, in terms of what are the opportunities for health centers to connect with uh, local award, you know, CDC awardees for these different projects and get access to the data and the like. But I will offer first that, you know, HRSA is really interested in making sure that these connections happen and with some of the awards and resources that are already out, in addition to working more closely with our colleagues in CDC as they uh, develop additional opportunities to make sure we have a strong linkage uh, between our, our health centers and uh, state and otherwise uh, awardees. I think one of the things that we can say for sure is and we've known this for a while and I will say working in the COVID response that clearly the COVID-19 pandemic has shown the critical importance of strong collaboration between public health and primary care. So, um, you know, Ari, do you have some thoughts about how your state level brace programs can work more closely with health centers? Or health centers can work more closely with them, vice versa? Yeah, I think um, they could implement uh, new research, uh, but also they can email the climate and health at cdc.gov um, or check on our own website uh, on the um, Climate Ready States and Cities Initiative. Uh, which has links to state and local program websites, and I'll, I'll drop we'll drop that link in into our program in there. Uh, but yeah, we do a lot of collaborations with um, inter with multiple agencies. Um, a lot of our grantees will collaborate with universities, but also the the local climate offices. Um, so there are rooms for all sorts of collaboration, and we would love to um, also involve more more health centers, um, as as you could see that was in our previous analysis uh, looking at flooding. Mr. Manangan, I think this question leads into our next question, which is how can other communities learn from grantees and how do grantees learn from one another? Yeah, so the CDC climate and health grantees, they're, they're organized themselves into subgroups or what we're also calling communities of practice. Uh, they can utilize each other's strengths, to reach the common goal of reducing these health effects uh, of climate change. So each of the funded jurisdictions has a different set of climate related health effects. So these are kind of local, local issues that they need to address, but they can also learn from each other um, or pool their resources to develop the most effective health interventions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manangan, and thank you, Dr. Gillespie and Dr. Nair for answering these important questions. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Brycey and Dr. Nair for closing remarks. Dr. Brycey, please proceed. Yes, good afternoon again, everybody. So thank you very much. As you hear, these are very important topics. There's nothing more important today in the public health community than addressing climate-related issues. And while there's a lot of work on the climate reduction front, there needs to be a, a parallel effort addressing the health effects of climate change as well. These, health, these, these changes are causing health effects today. They're gonna to get worse in the future and we need to mobilize the health community to help address this. So I'm excited that we were able to talk about that today. Dr. Nair. Thank you, Dr. Bricey. And a big thanks to everyone who made this session possible, everyone who organized it and all of those who joined us today. Uh, it's been such a wonderful session full of great information
information with immediate opportunities to learn more or take action. I think that there we have the opportunity to use existing data and maps uh, that health centers can start right away to understand the climate and health impacts in their own communities and the populations they serve. And then also consider how to leverage the wealth of information that you have on your service area and patients from your electronic health records and other health information technology tools that you have, potentially with other data and information that you have through health information exchanges that you're connected with to better care for your patients and communities. Um, you know, as we've all just learned, there's a lot of work ahead of us, but as the saying goes, information is power. And I hope that you will be able to take some of this information forward in your organizations to think about your respective roles in addressing climate change and health related impacts. Uh, on your organization and on the communities that you serve. Um, I hope that this wonderful partnership between CDC and HRSA will support uh, ongoing and increasing local and state level collaborations between public health and primary care to address this critical topic. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Commander Khan. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bryson and Dr. Nair. Um, and thank you again for joining us for today's EH Nexus webinar and with a special thanks to our presenters. If you have additional questions, you may email them to ehnexus at, at ehnexus at cdc.gov. Take care and have a great day.